on World News Tonight. Lights out. Pakistan is shrouded in darkness as the national electricity grid gives out under pressure from unmet demands. Lunar massacre. A shooting in California that took 10 lives may never have its justice met with the culprit opting to take their own demise. Stepping aside. While not a direct helping hand, Germany has decided it will not hinder the process of providing more firepower to Ukraine by neighbouring Poland. And luminous festivities. China finally celebrates the much-awaited Lunar New Year with spectacular performances. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. As usual, we have a number of comprehensive coverages from across the globe for you tonight as well. We start off with our neighboring Pakistan. A nationwide power outage in Pakistan left nearly 220 million people without electricity, threatening to cause havoc in the South Asian nation already grappling with fuel shortages in the winter months. The country's Minister of Energy said in a statement the country's national grid went down at 7.34 a.m. at Pakistan time, causing a widespread breakdown in the power system. The ministry said limited number of grids in the capital Islamabad and the city of Peshawar have had power restored. It is unclear how long the outage will last and the efforts are underway to restore power to various parts of the country. The outage comes as the country's fragile economy continues to struggle with multiple challenges, including a severe energy crisis. Earlier this month, Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif ordered all federal departments to reduce their energy consumption by 30 percent, while his government ordered all markets to close by 8.30 p.m. and restaurants by 10 p.m. In December, the country's total liquid foreign exchange reserve stood at $11.7 billion, which is half the amount it held at the start of last year, according to the central bank. Monday's power outage in Pakistan's most widespread power shutdown since 2021, which the nation plunged into darkness for hours after a sudden plunge in the frequency in the power transmission system. Meanwhile, China celebrated that much-anticipated Lunar New Year, with many citizens praying against illness in hopes of protecting against the COVID pandemic that has run rampant across the nation for the past three years and continues to deal heavy mortality rates over the past few months. China rang in the Lunar New Year on Sunday, with its people praying for health after three years of stress and financial hardship under the pandemic. Queues stretched for a half mile outside the iconic Lama Temple in Beijing, which had been repeatedly shut before COVID-19 restrictions ended in early December, with thousands of people waiting for their turn to pray for their loved ones. As officials reported almost 13,000 new deaths caused by the virus between January 13th and 19th. This toll added to the nearly 60,000 in the month or so before that. We need to work hard to solve these problems and keep going, said Beijing resident Gong. I hope we can have a better future and everyone can have a better life, he stated. This is the first Lunar New Year in two years without COVID-19 restrictions and it sparked a mass movement of people. On the Lunar New Year Eve, more than 26 million trips were made by railway, highways, ships and planes. Half the pre-pandemic levels but up by about 50% from last year, state-run CCTV reported. Celebrating with his family, real estate professional Guo Jin says he wishes for prosperous business, restored production, but most importantly, good health. We have a senior in our family. He is in his 80s. I hope he stays healthy, he says. As millions of migrant workers return home for Lunar New Year celebrations, health experts are particularly concerned about people living in China's vast countryside, where medical facilities are poor compared with those in richer coastal areas. Over in New Zealand now, following the shocking resignation of current PM Jacinda Ardern, New Zealand's Labour Party has unanimously endorsed Education Minister Chris Hipkins to succeed current Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern as the party leader. Hipkins was the only nominee for the leadership position, so his endorsement was largely a formality. The Labour team of MPs unanimously endorsed me as their new leader and as the next Prime Minister of New Zealand. 
Arden said she would be stepping down from the country's top job in a surprise announcement last Thursday, citing exhaustion. A career politician who entered parliament in 2008, Hipkins became a household name while leading New Zealand's pandemic management as COVID-19 response minister in Arden's cabinet. Aside from being Education Minister, he is also Minister of Police and the Public Service and Leader of the House. Speaking to reporters after nominations closed Saturday morning, Hipkins committed to leading the country in a strong, stable and unified way, but cautioned that there were challenges ahead. Look, it's a big day for a boy from the hut. Uh, and uh, look, I'm, I'm really honoured and humbled uh, by uh, the, the support that my colleagues have shown towards me. Uh, it's an enormous privilege. It's an, also an enormous responsibility uh, and the weight of that responsibility uh, is still sinking in uh, but I absolutely take that very seriously and, I, and I'm really looking forward to it. Chris Hipkins has named Carmel Sepuloni as his deputy making her the first person of Pacifica descent to hold the role. Hipkins will announce his full cabinet later but has said that he plans to keep the former deputy prime minister Grant Robertson on as finance minister. Outlining his priorities as Prime Minister, he promised to help Kiwi families and businesses through the country's cost of living crisis, which will be a key issue in the general election later this year. Now, Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva has sacked the country's army chief Julio César de Arruda in the wake of riots earlier this month by supporters of former leader Jair Bolsonaro. Cesar de Arruda had only been appointed army chief on December 30, but on Saturday was fired from the role as the fallout continues after the January 8 riots on government buildings in Brasilia. According to the defence minister, he was ousted due to a breakdown in confidence and authorities needed to turn the page on the incident. After the episodes of January 8, there was a breach of trust. Arruda's dismissal comes days after President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva sacked members of his own security detail. After the riots, Lula said many members of the army allowed them to happen. At least 140 military officers have been fired since he took office on January 1st. Many officers were collaborating with rioters. I am convinced that the door of the Planato Palace was open so that these people could enter. Arruda has been replaced by southeastern military commander Tomás Ribeiro Paiva. Earlier this week, Paiva made a speech urging soldiers to accept the results of the presidential election and said personnel should be apolitical. Rioters who stormed Brazilian Congress, the presidential palace and the Supreme Court sought to have the military intervene following the vote and overturn the loss of former President Jair Bolsonaro. A 72-year-old gunman killed himself when approached by police about 12 hours after he had carried out a Lunar New Year massacre at a dance club that left 10 people dead and another 10 wounded. A man suspected of killing 10 people near Los Angeles on Saturday during Lunar New Year celebrations has killed himself after being approached by police. The man's body was found on Sunday in a van in Torrance, California, just a short drive from Monterey Park, where Saturday's shooting took place at a ballroom dance hall. Los Angeles County Sheriff Robert Luna. A white van entered a shopping center parking lot when officers exited their patrol vehicle to contact the occupant, they heard one gunshot coming from within the van. The suspect has been identified as who, as who can Tran. He is a 72-year-old male Asian. Earlier, the Sheriff's Department released images of Tran apparently taken from surveillance camera footage. Luna confirmed that he was involved in a second incident at a dance venue in the neighbouring city of Alhambra. Witnesses said Tran walked in holding a gun that patrons were able to grab. No one was shot and Tran fled. Investigators do not yet know the motive of Saturday's attack, although gun violence is frequent in the United States. The celebration in Monterey Park, home to one of the largest Asian American communities in the US, was part of a weekend of Lunar New Year festivities that drew thousands to the city. As of Sunday night, seven people were still being treated in hospital from the attack, 
with at least one person in a critical condition. Local residents spoke of the shock they felt as dozens gathered to pray for the victims. This is a community where my kids took art lessons. Um, we come down here for food all the time. Uh, we see elders walking around all the time. This has been a safe neighborhood for them to walk around and have community. Historic Taiwanese Chinese community. So to see this happen in uh, this place is shattering. The White House flag was lowered to honor the victims. In a written statement, President Joe Biden condemned the killings and said he had directed his Homeland Security Advisor to mobilize federal support to local authorities. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, 13 hours of searching in U.S. President Joe Biden's home has led to even more controversial findings of confidential documents. Some items date back to his time in the Senate and as vice president. The FBI conducted the search at the invitation of the president's legal team in coordination with the Justice Department, which is now reviewing the found material. Tonight, the unprecedented FBI search of a sitting president's home for classified documents, escalating the legal and political situation for President Biden. The White House revealing yet another bombshell late Saturday, that six items with classification markings were discovered Friday after an exhaustive 13-hour search of the president's Wilmington, Delaware home, some of them dating back to his time in the Senate and as vice president. The FBI conducting the search at the invitation of the president's legal team in coordination with the Justice Department, which is now reviewing the material. It's the fourth such discovery after fewer than a dozen classified documents were found at the president's former office in Washington, D.C. in November, along with more in his Wilmington garage and an adjacent room in recent weeks, though the total number is still unknown. Lawmakers on both sides of the aisle reacting to this latest revelation. Some members of the president's own political party scrutinizing his first public comments since the appointment of a special counsel. There's no there there. I have no regrets. The White House and Democrats repeatedly pointing to the differences between Mr. Biden and his predecessor's cases. This latest search done without the need for a warrant, unlike the FBI seizure at former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate last August. Now, still in the U.S., Vice President Kamala Harris rallied against efforts in Washington and in Republican-led states to restrict abortion on what would have been the 50th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, invoking fundamental American values such as freedom to make the case for protecting abortion access despite the Supreme Court's decision to eliminate constitutional protections for it. Abortion rights across the U.S. are under threat, according to Vice President Kamala Harris. She took aim at Republicans on Sunday as she spoke in Florida to mark the 50th anniversary of the now overturned Roe v. Wade decision. Republicans in Congress are now calling for a nationwide abortion ban. Some even from the moment of conception. The right of every woman in every state in this country to make decisions about her own body is on the line. And I've said it before and I will say it again, how dare they? How dare they? The White House says as many as 60 anti-abortion bills have been filed in the 2023 legislative session so far. In Florida itself, the state last year passed an abortion ban without exceptions for rape and incest. Harris said a majority of Americans opposed the anti-abortion measures. Democrats and some Republicans cite concerns about the loss of abortion rights for Republicans' weaker-than-expected performance in last year's midterm elections. From Kansas to California, Michigan, Montana, Kentucky and Vermont, they spoke with their vote. In essence, they said, one does not have to abandon their faith or deeply held beliefs to agree that the government should not be telling people what to do with their own bodies. Harris's comments came as thousands of people across the U.S. held rallies and events to mark the Roe v. Wade ruling, which since 1973 conferred women the constitutional right to abortion, until the U.S. Supreme Court overturned it in June last year. In Wisconsin, protesters filled the halls of the state capitol building, calling to overturn the state's abortion ban. 
Voters in the state will head to the polls next month for the primary election for the Wisconsin Supreme Court and elect a new Supreme Court justice in April. The state's top court has a 4-3 conservative majority, but if a pro-choice candidate wins this seat, the state's abortion ban could be overturned. Abortion is also expected to be a key issue in the 2024 elections. The German government will not object if Poland decides to send Leopard 2 battle tanks to Ukraine, indicating movement on supplying weapons that Kyiv has described as essential to its ability to fend off an intensified Russian offensive. In a possible breakthrough for Kyiv, German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock said on Sunday her government would not stand in the way if Poland wants to send its German-made Leopard 2 tanks to Ukraine. Ukraine has been asking Western allies for the German-made tanks for months, but Berlin has so far held back from sending them or allowing other NATO countries to do so. Baerbock's statement comes after Poland signaled that it could send the tank without Germany's approval. Her remarks appear to go further than German Chancellor Olaf Scholz's comments at a news conference in Paris earlier that day. Scholz said that Germany will not slacken support to Ukraine and will continue to act as long as necessary, but that all decisions on weapons deliveries will be made in coordination with allies, particularly the United States. Germany has faced mounting pressure to send Leopard 2 tanks, which is considered one of the West's best, to Ukraine. Western allies met Friday to discuss the issue, but did not reach a decision. Scholl's Social Democrat Party is traditionally skeptical of military involvements and worries sudden movements could trigger Moscow. But on Sunday, German Defense Minister Boris Pisterius said he expected a decision on the tanks soon. Other allied nations have offered to send their own tanks to Ukraine, but experts say for Ukraine's fight, those tanks don't stand up to the Leopard 2. The Kremlin's spokesman said on Friday that Western countries supplying additional tanks to Ukraine would not change the course of the conflict, and that they would add to the problems of the Ukrainian people. Outrage over a Quran-burning protest in Sweden produced a second day of protests in Turkey, reflecting tensions between the two countries. Some 250 people gathered outside the Swedish consulate in Istanbul, where a photo of Danish anti-Islam activist Rasmus Paludan was set on fire. A protest erupted in front of the Swedish consulate in Istanbul on Saturday in response to a right-wing politician who earlier set fire to the Quran at a rally in Stockholm. Turkey called it a vile act. The Quran is regarded as the word of God in Islam, and any attack on it is deeply offensive to Muslims. What has upset Turkey just as much is that Swedish authorities apparently allowed Rasmus Paludan to burn the Quran while the police and media looked on. The Scandinavian country has very strong free speech laws. Ankara has now cancelled a visit due by the Swedish defence minister that was aimed at helping to remove Turkey's objections to the country joining the NATO military alliance along with Finland. But there are also those in Sweden who don't want the country to join anyway. A few hours after the right-wing provocation, an anti-NATO protest also took place in Stockholm. Some of the demonstrators were Kurdish refugees. Turkey considers some of them terrorists and calls on Sweden to stop protecting them as the price of Ankara's blessing for acceptance into NATO. Tens of thousands of Israelis joined demonstrations on Saturday against judicial reform plans by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's new government that protesters say will threaten democratic checks and balances on ministers by the courts. The plans which the government says are needed to curb overreach by activist judges have drawn fierce opposition from groups including lawyers and raised concerns amongst business leaders, widening an already deep political division in Israeli society. Netanyahu has dismissed the protests now in the third week as a refusal by leftist opponents to accept the results of last November's election which produced one of the most right-wing governments in Israel's history. The protesters say the future of Israeli democracy is at stake if the plans, which would tighten government control over judicial appointments and limit the Supreme Court's power to review government decisions, go through, as well as threatening the independence of judges and weakening oversight of the government and parliament, they say the plans will undermine the rights of minorities and open the door to more corruption. 
Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu dismissed a senior cabinet member with a criminal record, complying with the Supreme Court ruling even as he pursues contested judicial reforms that would curb its powers. Pledging to find every legal means to keeping Arya Derry in public office in the future, Netanyahu told him he was being removed from the Interior and Health Ministries during the weekly cabinet session, according to an official transcript. Derry himself was apparently late to the cabinet meeting, leaving the chair next to Netanyahu around the government table empty. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Arena Sabalenka overpowered Belinda Bensik 7-5 to 6-2 to reach the Australian Open quarterfinals for the first time, getting a head straight after going down an early break to blast a Swiss opponent off the court. Anderson Talisa earned Al Nasser a 1-0 home win over Al Ittifaq, but the fans turned up to Mersul Park in droves to see Cristiano Ronaldo in action, were left disappointed after he was unable to mark his Saudi Pro League debut with a goal. Islamist fighters set off a bomb and stormed a government building in Somalia's capital, killing at least six civilians. Attackers from the Al-Shabaab group charged into the block that houses the office of Mogadishu's mayor around noon and got caught in a firefight with security forces. Thirteen people were killed in a residential building collapsed in the northern Syrian city of Aleppo and rescue workers were searching for people believed still buried under the rubble. Hollywood superstar Akshay Kumar launched a trailer of his upcoming comedy drama film Selfie in India's western Mumbai city. Emran Hashmi, Mishrad Barucha, Diana Penty and director Raj Mehta were among others who accompanied Kumar at the trailer launch event. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can always watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. Now we leave you tonight with visuals of the 2023 Spring Festival Gala, hosted and aired by China Media Group, which has brought audiences a grand treat of colorful performances ranging from singing and dancing to comedic sketches and acrobatics. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.